Well, I want to uh, take a, a look at uh, the home again. And if you want to turn to session two in your book, uh, we want to be looking at the foundation. And uh, I told you these two sessions, we want to look at that. And we want to look specifically today, or this evening, this time, at uh, what went wrong. You know, if marriage has all this potential, what went wrong? And it's crucial that we uh, keep in mind, you know, God's design, God's goal for marriage. Uh, Because like Yogi Berra said, and you always want to quote Yogi, (laughs) if you don't know where you're going, you may end up somewhere else. And you think on his for a while, and, and uh, a lot of people, intermarriage marriage, they don't know where they're going, really. They don't know what marriage is all about. And uh, we want to remember that God's great design for marriage is intimacy. You can say many other things about marriage. You can talk about its design as propagation of the race, uh, uh, the pleasure of marriage. Uh, the ultimate picture, or the ultimate design of marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. But I'm going to use that term intimacy because the intimacy that God designed into marriage, the two becoming one, that is really central to every one of those things. And so I want to keep that in mind. And I would just say that uh, you look back at Genesis again. We're going to go back there. Genesis 1, verse 27. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. There's something about the way we were created, male and female, that is to reflect the image of God. And I don't want to say too much there because I don't think we can say too much, but the way the Bible insists on it, I think we'd be remiss to not see that God's, the reflection of God that we portray would be incomplete with just male or just female. He created us male and female, and together there is the image of God reflected. Now, some of you are single, and I would hasten to add, you don't have to be married to reflect the image of God. And in fact, uh, Paul writes about the special purpose and place and potential of a single person to really glorify God. But just the same, even as a single person, you're within the body of Christ where there are males and females and the body of Christ is, an, is a reflection of God. But I'm talking now about marriage where the two become one. And it's somehow, and I want to be very careful. I think we should be very careful when we say this. But God is one. And yet He is three. And that's a mystery we can't fully understand. And there's, to some extent, that is to be reflected in the marriage bond. Two becoming one in a way that we can't fully Grass. But more, more pointedly, and I can say this with much more authority, God's love for His own is to be reflected in marriage. God's love for redeemed ones. God's love for the church. And the church isn't an institution. It's not a uh, building with a steeple on it. It is the people who have put their faith in Jesus Christ of every denominational background. doesn't matter. It, it, it includes people, eventually, the Bible says it's going to include people of every tribe and tongue who have come to know Jesus Christ. We are the, the bride of Christ, and He is the bridegroom. And the ultimate expression of a marriage should be a picture of that. Now, obviously, our marriages are always less than uh, good pictures of that, or I should say less than perfect pictures. But it is something that God wants us to do, and that is to reflect uh, Christ in the church. And there's portions in the New Testament we'll look at later that we'll talk about that. But I think it's helpful to uh, remember what we were talking about. We're created in the image of God, and by that I mean we have body, soul, and spirit. We have capacity to relate uh, to God in our spirit. And there, in marriage, you have two people body, soul, and spirit, and you have the potential for relationship physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And uh, the highest of those, of course, is the latter, spiritually. Uh, Animals can mate and have sex, and they tell me that some animals 
actually are monogamous in the sense that they make lifetime commitments to one mate. Uh, but we, distinct from the animal kingdom, we're created in the image of God, and we have the potential in marriage to have intimacy at a spiritual level, at a f- emotional level, and at the physical level. And that is really what God wants. And you could picture it like this. You have two individuals, and as we grow, we're to become more one. And that's God's desire, that the two become more and more one. And I think that's a good way to, uh, to picture it. Now, God's design is intimacy in all three realms, as I said. And uh, obviously, and well, maybe not so obviously, that's a process. Uh, it's a lifelong process. And there's great potential for joy and love and peace. And home can become a place of real refuge. But in saying all that, I ask the question, what went wrong? What went wrong? I mean, why is it that there's so little of that when you look around and we thought about it you know and you you see these uh, marriages that start with so much potential and everything looks good on the outside and yet it's really not what it seems and you know you can say well you know you're looking at people that are there's problems there to begin with but really I could be showing you pictures of some of your parents couldn't I I mean the wedding day it all looked so good. And nobody enters marriage, you know, without high expectations. We start thinking, this is going to be great. This is really going to work. And so, uh, you know, the, the potential is there. But uh, it doesn't always work out. And there is that disillusionment uh, and that sadness. Now, you might say, well, you know, and in fact, as I look at those, I think, well, you know, I mean... Some of them you could you could figure, you know. But there, <laughs> there was one I really had high hopes for. I, I, I just don't know what went wrong there. I, I was uh, really disappointed. <laughs> but you know, it is amazing because we read about these people. They write the music we sing, some of them, they, you know, the movies. The, the influence this kind of stuff has on us. And as I said, it isn't just the celebrities. It's right down in our own homes. We could be putting our wedding pictures up there, and yet there's many a joyous wedding that turns into sadness. Why, why is that? What went wrong? Well, turn back to Genesis with me. Genesis 1 and 2, it doesn't end. It doesn't end. Uh, Genesis 3 is the key to understanding your marriage. It really is. And uh, Genesis 3 is the key to understanding your spouse. And Genesis 3 is the key to understanding uh, your life, your eternity. In fact, many people try to read the Bible without factoring in Genesis 3. If you skip over the third chapter of Genesis, you miss a very key chapter of all the Bible. And the source of all marital trouble, all marital tensions, all marital issues, you can trace right back to uh, this chapter. And this is why what we're going to see in chapter 3, right at the start, what we're going to see is why you can't just put your marriage on autopilot. Why you can't just, it'll be happily ever after and expect that it will be. It won't be. If you just drift in marriage... I can just about guarantee you, you will drift toward the rocks. There might have been a day, uh, maybe a couple generations ago in our culture, where the cultural influences were strong enough and the taboo of any kind of thing but making a marriage work was strong enough that you could take it easy and your marriage would still survive. It wasn't maybe happy marriage, but people made it. But today, if you, uh, if you try to just coast, or just drift, you'll be drifting toward the rocks inevitably. And so we want, to, we want to look at the source of marital troubles. Verse 1, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Now the serpent, 
You know, the devil, Satan, is a major player in the Bible all the way through. Uh, He's called in the Old Testament the destroyer. In the New Testament, destruction. He's the thief. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He's a very real spiritual being, and he's very crafty. Notice, the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field, and he craftily comes to Eve. And in an incredulous tone, he says, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Now, his incredulous tone is both disturbing and flattering. It's disturbing in that it's questioning God's word to Eve. But it's flattering in that it's inviting her to debate God's word and decide whether and make a judgment on it whether or not she wants to agree or disagree with God. And then notice his exaggeration. Uh, because read back up in verse 17 of chapter 2. Verse 16, really, the Lord commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day you eat from it, you shall surely die. Well, when Satan comes along, he says, Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? And uh, he exaggerates what God said. He uh, you know, intensifies the strictness of what God said, and he invites Eve into the debate. And uh, she gets right involved, verse 2. The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said you shall not eat from it or touch it, lest you die. Now she uh, overcorrects it too. God said, don't eat of it. She said, he said, don't eat, don't even touch it. And, you know, people have been doing that ever since, taking God's word and adding things. And again, uh, you know, magnifying God's, God's strictness. And uh, many have followed Eve in this. But then the serpent said to the woman, verse 4, You surely shall not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. And you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, he moves from questioning God's word to outright, flatly contradicting God's word. You won't die. He's a liar. He's saying God's a liar. But I'll tell you who the liar is. Jesus said he's the father of lies. He's the most skillful liar. He makes all the good liars today you know, he, he can outlie anybody. And good liars are very believable, aren't they? That's how they can be such good liars. They get a lot of people to believe them. And Satan is the best. He's the father of liars. He's the destroyer. He's the thief. And he hasn't changed. His strategy hasn't changed either. He's going to come to us, and he's going to question God's word. He's going to come with an incredulous tone. Does God talk of roles in marriage? <laughs> You believe that? And haven't you heard that? Isn't that the voice that often comes, you know? And he'll exaggerate, he'll disturb. He'll say to you gals, is that all you are? Is just a helper? (laughs) And he'll, just by the way he says it, he'll make it seem as if that, he doesn't tell you what I told you earlier, that God is our helper, that God is our help a very strong refuge for us. He doesn't talk to you about the beauty and the dignity of that role. He just says, is that the way it is for you Christians? Do you believe that Bible? you believe that old myth? And then he'll come right out and he'll say, it won't hurt your marriage. It won't kill you. It won't hurt your marriage to disregard what God has to say. Does God really talk about it? Nah. Does he tell you, does God say to love your wife? He'll say to you husbands, love yourself. Love yourself. Look out for yourself. Love her if she's lovable, I guess. But uh, don't get pushed around. You've got to look out for yourself. You're the leader here. And should a wife respect her husband, the Bible says? 
He's not respectable. What about your personhood? He'll tell you. And he'll tell you, point blank, it won't hurt anything. It won't hurt anything. From sleeping together before marriage to breaking all the principles of marriage, he'll say, don't worry about it. In fact, it's better. It's better for you if you'll do it your way rather than God's way. Oh, he's a good liar. He's a good liar. And uh, he'll tell you, point blank, it won't hurt you. It won't kill you. And I'll tell you, with such logic, many a marriage has met its death. You surely shall not die. Oh, yes, you will. When Satan says something, he's lying. The only time he uses the truth is to amplify one of his lies. He's just a liar. That's all there is to it. And uh, you mark it. He works overtime on you and me. And he's going to work overtime tonight, tomorrow, and in the weeks and months to come. Because we're being exposed to God's truth. And this is a great opportunity for us to begin to hear truth. And truth liberates. God's truth sets free. God's truth has power. And the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, can use God's word in our lives to transform us. And he wants to. But Satan will work overtime to have you and me disbelieve God's word. Or forget about it. That would be okay, too. You can just kind of push it aside and get back to reading Parade Magazine. you know, Or whatever else you read, rather than God's Word. Uh, he'd like you to neglect it. And he'll say to you, verse 5, God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. He'll say... That God doesn't have your best interests in mind. In fact, if you do what God says, you'll miss out on something. And if you'll do what God says not to do, that's when your marriage will improve. He'll tell you that sort of thing. Well, verse 6, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, and by the way, sin looks delicious. (laughs) Men... When Satan tempts you to be unfaithful, it's not going to come in an ugly package with a pitchfork and a red tail. Satan doesn't come that way. (laughs) He's going to say, this looks good. And she saw that the tree was good for food. It was a delight to the eyes, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life. These are the things Satan deals in, we're told in 1 John 2, 15. When she saw that, she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Immediately, guilt, shame, fear. And what do you have? The first cover up sew some fig leaves together and hide and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden then the Lord God called to the man and said to them said to him where are you and he said I heard the sound of thee in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked so I hid myself there was fear and uh, they hid themselves and by the way You'll notice here, who does the seeking of who? God does the seeking. And by the way, that's always the way it's been ever since Adam sinned. Uh, God is the one who does the seeking and the saving. Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. We've been hiding from God ever since. And even when people say they're seeking God, they'll seek Him in any place and every place. They'll invent stories about Mars and Venus rather than submit to the truth of God. Uh, God is the one who seeks, and we're the ones who hide out. But then God said, verse 11, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Point blank. He says, Did you eat of the tree which I told you not to eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be be with me. She gave me from the tree, and I ate. The woman 
the blame game starts. Right here. Blaming someone else beside yourself. And he blames who? The very gift of God to him. The one that God had provided for him. He says, the woman whom you gave me. He's blaming his wife and he's blaming who? God. Yeah. That is so basic to human nature ever since. How many times have I been counseling with couples? And they'll say, yeah, but she... And the blame starts. Why is it that we're just built that way? Well, ever since Adam and Eve sinned, we've had this by nature. This is just the way we operate. We're sinful and we blame anyone and everyone, even God, rather than own up to our own guilt and take responsibility for our own actions. And within marriage, it's so disastrous. And, of course, it gets passed on. I mean, you know, you read, it's interesting, very interesting to read the book of Genesis. Christians should more than they do. But, uh, you know, Adam and Eve had kids, and Cain and Abel. You think about it, the very first family, there was a murder. It's a sad tragedy to see what happens. You know, Chris and I have had five kids, and it is such a joy when you have kids. I mean, I, I still remember the times, especially the first one, you know, at the hospital. It's just like you're in a different zone or something to have this child, and you have this little angel, and you bring them home, you know, and you find out they're not a little angel. <laughs> we had five kids, and every one of them, you don't have to teach them how to lie. You don't have to teach them how to blame everybody else. They come by it naturally. They've got their mother's nature. <laughs> now, I, I told you I, I'm no expert on these things about getting along with my wife. <laughs> now, I can say that, I and mean, I say it in jest, because you know who the Bible blames? Adam. It's my nature they got. The sin nature comes through the man. Uh, Jesus was born without that sin nature. But anyway, uh, you know what I'm saying. It, we come by it naturally, and it is so destructive to marriage. We'll blame even those closest. In fact, especially those closest to us. What did you do, eat? The woman did it. And he blames his wife. The reluctance of sinful people to own up to things. Verse 13, Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you've done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So much begins right here. Conflict. Because you see, in marriage, blame only escalates things. And the conflict gets deeper. And communication, it just comes to a standstill. That's why the guy or the gal wrote, that I wrote, read earlier, you know, Communication is a key to your marriage. How many of you have seen communicate and communicate and finally communicate through their lawyers? Now, communication doesn't really come to a standstill. Just positive communication comes to a standstill when you're blaming. And negative communication continues. And uh, intimacy? Ah, uh, that's no way to build oneness. It's awful hard to get close to someone when you're pointing at them. But that's what happened here, and that's what's been happening ever since. Uh, There's plenty of this happening. But that's not all. Verse 14. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you've done this, cursed are you more than all the cattle, and more than every beast of the field. And on your belly shall you go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. And I'll put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you shall bring forth children. Yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you've listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you. And you shall 
Eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, because from it you are taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The curse. God did mean what He said. The day you eat of that tree, you shall surely die. And Adam and Eve died spiritually. They didn't die physically just yet. But verse 19 says where they're going. They're going to die physically too. But God did mean exactly what He said. And Satan was lying. He always is. He always is. And notice in the curse here, fundamental elements of human life, family life, marriage, are impacted. Childbearing, verse 16. The joy and hope and anticipation and blessing of children is tempered by pain and anguish. And uh, through the centuries, I mean, we live in a day when we don't realize just how blessed we are to have the kind of medical help we have and to have, uh, you know, but you you go through an old cemetery, for instance, and see how many kids die in childbirth and how many mothers died in childbirth. And uh, it's a very real A very real issue. And marriage, the enmity that would be between the seed of the woman and the serpent, just so that kind of enmity will be between the two who were to be one, the husband and the wife, the one God had given him to be his helper suitable according to him that fit fit him. There would be enmity between them. Verse 16, Yet your desire shall be... For your husband. This is the curse, remember. He's not talking about sexual desire here. The only other time he uses this, it's very clear that he's saying here, he uses it when he he rebuked Cain and Abel right next door in chapter 4, and he uses it one other time in the Old Testament. But he's saying here, you will have a desire to rule over Adam. Eve, your desire shall be for your husband. You'll seek to conquer. You'll seek to dominate him. How? Well, nagging, manipulating, controlling, you name it. But that's what you're going to be like now, he said. And he shall rule over you. The man, instead of loving his wife and leading her and being her head as he should have been, will now dominate and misuse and abuse and have a sinful tendency. Two people who were to come together are now two sinful, selfish people. And the whole process of intimacy is clouded by this. And I'll tell you, it probably dates me to even use the term, but you have here, right here in verse 16, the beginning of feminism and chauvinism. You don't hear that term too much, especially the second one. Anymore, but it used to be so popular to talk about. But still, this is the this is the root beginning of these two movements. And of course, not just marriage. I mean, providing, just making a living. Verse seventeen, you know, cursed is the ground because of you. Providing is going to be drastically more difficult and complicated than prior to sin. And and everybody that's married, or just about everybody that's married, knows that making a living and financial things and all all those kinds of things, things aren't easy. It's not going to be just easy. And in fact, you can can look back at all marital stress and all problems and all failure, and you can see that the natural ramification and result of what took place. And that's why... I could give you all the good marriage advice in the world. And in fact, I'll even put it this way, all the good marriage advice in the Bible. And there's something in us that we won't follow the good advice. It's called sin. And so you can say, well, you need to communicate. But like the gal wrote in the book, you know, you end up communicating all night and you want to kill each other by the end of the communication. That's because of what's gone on inside. Now you have this two becoming one clouded by this. And you've got husbands, uh, I mean even Christian husbands, because we've got a sin nature, suppressing, selfishly dominating, criticizing, misusing, cutting down, turning her into just a sex object. And wives, you've got your problems too. Uh, We've all got these problems, but that's not all either. Look back there, right in the middle of the curse at verse 15. I'll put enmity, he's talking to the serpent now. 
I'll put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He, the seed of the woman. Now, we'd never expect him to say this. He, the seed of the woman. You'd expect to say the seed of the man, but he says the seed of the woman. He shall bruise you, Satan, on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Right in the midst of this dark, dreary passage, you have the very first promise of a Savior. This is a prophecy of Jesus Christ, who will be born of the virgin. And this is a picture, verse 15, of the crushing of Satan's head by the heel of Jesus Christ. Oh, he might bruise his heel, but you're going to be bruised on the head, and that's fatal for a snake. And it's a picture of the great victory of Jesus Christ over sin. Now, this is the first promise, but God has hundreds of them in the Bible. He says the Savior is going to come from the human race. He says it right here. He's going to come from Abraham. He said he's going to come not just from Abraham, and he won't come from Ishmael. He'll come from Isaac, not from Esau, Jacob. He begins to narrow down right back here in the early pages of the Bible where this Savior will come from. He'll come from the nation founded by Abraham. He'll come from Jacob, not Esau. And then Jacob had 12 sons, and he said he will come from the tribe of Judah. He even tells the tribe. And we haven't even got out of Genesis yet, and he's told us all that. And then the rest of the Old Testament, he begins to point in a supernatural way. He tells even the place Jesus would be born hundreds of years before he was born. He tells the time. And these prophecies are crucial to seeing what God is doing. God provided a Savior. And it's crucial for our marriages to understand that. And so I want to take just a minute and talk about it tonight. God, uh, I, I find it helpful to, to describe God this way. I like to, to uh, picture Him with two parallel lines. God is a God. The Bible's God now. I'm talking about the one we're talking about here. God is a God of love, and I represent that by the top line there. And God is a God of justice. And uh, you can talk about other attributes of God, but He's a God of mercy. But I would lump that under His love. He's a God of holiness, but I would lump that there under justice. I'm talking about the two sides of God's character. Now, man, we're created, as we've seen, in the image of God. And we have... uh, a body, we have physical life, we have emotional life, we have a soul, but we have this spiritual capacity, this spiritual ability to relate to God. And we were created for a love relationship with God. And uh, God desired that love relationship with us. But when Adam and Eve sinned, why, that spiritual life was uh, killed. The day you eat of that tree, you'll surely die. And they died. They didn't die physically. They didn't die emotionally. They were still talking to one another and hiding out from God and feeling guilty and ashamed and covering themselves. But they died spiritually. And that capacity to know God became short-circuited. And sin brought brought them under God's justice so that you have man down here uh, under the very justice of God, the day you eat of that tree, you'll surely die. And man died and is spiritually dead. Now, man knows that instinctively, and he tries to reach back to God. And I'm going to represent that by that little arrow there, uh, man's efforts to reach back to God in his love. And the first one that comes to my mind is, is religion. A lot of people go to church and think that that will uh, make them right with God. And a lot of people think that's what Christianity is all about. You know, you go to church enough and maybe you put enough time in purgatory and you'll go to heaven. That's the way they look at church, (laughs) you know. And uh, somebody else maybe thinks, no, I'm not all that religious, but that's kind of hypocritical anyway. You know that religious guy, he goes to church, but if you really uh, look at his life, he's not not as good as he says he is. And the next person there, that arrow that goes a little higher, why he, he says, I just try to be a good person. After all... That's what really counts, isn't it? I mean, didn't even Jesus say, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. That's my religion. I meet people like that that say that, you know, they're going to be good enough and they're 
And they'll say, as long as you don't hurt anybody. That's the thing. That's the main thing. And somebody else, uh, you know, will come along and say, look, I'm not all that religious and I'm not even all that good. I'm just a sinner. But at least I'm honest about it. <laughs> you know? And this third guy, he, he kind of thinks uh, that God grades on the curve. <laughs> you know? He'll look at the religious guy and he'll look at the other person and he'll look around and he'll say, look, you know, I always loved it when teachers graded on the curve because nobody was going to do too well and you could just kind of hope that you'd be in the mix and it'd be okay. And a lot of people think that way about God. And so I know quite a few people who just kind of look down the street and they say, well, I'm maybe not as good as he is, but I've never done what he did, you know. And they figure, yeah, I may not get an A+, plus, but a C- minus will do, I'll get to heaven. And a lot of people think that way. And uh, somebody else maybe thinks, hey, I don't even believe in God, you know. Uh, you only go around once in life. You better get all the gusto you can get. But still, even that person, that fourth arrow that maybe says he doesn't believe in God, he's trying to fill that void in the center of his life at the spiritual, the spiritual emptiness that was created when man sinned. And I meet people, in fact, maybe you tonight. Uh, a lot of people are a combination of those, you know. Uh, they'll say, well, a little religion never hurt anybody. But the main thing is that you'd be a good person. And I think, you know, as long as you do pretty well, you'll be okay. If there is a God, I mean, if there's a man upstairs, I think it'll be okay as long as I try my best and, you know, that sort of thing. But, you know, really, none of these arrows should even be written that way. They don't get off the ground. They should be uh, down like that, you know. You can go to church, you can go to church, you can go to church, and you're still just a religious sinner. Because none of these arrows really dealt with the real problem, which was sin. And you really can't live your life without sinning. Somebody says, as long as you don't hurt anybody. How about if we had, instead of standing up for how many years you've been married, let's all stand up. Everybody that hasn't hurt anybody. Come on now, stand up. We've all hurt people. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But the good news of the Bible and the whole message of Christianity is that God is a God of love. He's a God of justice, but He's a God of love. And in His love, He provided a Savior, Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the perfect expression of God's love and God's justice. You want to know about God's justice? You look at the cross. Because the wages of sin is death. And Jesus Christ had no sin. He was the sinless one. He came and he could even say to his enemies, which one of you convicts me of sin? And they couldn't say anything. Oh, they tried a racial slur, but they, they couldn't say anything. The Bible says he committed no sin, nor was there any deceit found in his mouth. He lived like no man ever lived. I already pointed out the supernatural nature of all the prophecies that led to Christ. Hundreds of years before, Jesus fulfilled them to the T. And then his life was a life of perfection such that people of all backgrounds and all religions have to admit there was no one like Jesus Christ. He's amazing. He was the sinless one, and yet he died. Why? Because God meant it when he said the wages of sin is death. And when my sin was placed on Jesus Christ, he became an accursed thing on the cross, the scripture says. Yet you want to know about God's love? Look to the cross. For God so loved us that he sent his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus said it this way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't say some church is the way or some philosophy or trying to do your best. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So God made a way of salvation. But does that mean that everybody is saved? No, not at all. On the contrary, Jesus said that most people are on the broad road that leads to destruction. Few are on the narrow road that leads to life. And I want to be very careful here, but I want you to see this, that uh, just as sin brought me down under God's justice, the pathway back to God is Jesus Christ himself. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, 
the man, Christ Jesus. But if I were to diagram it, I would put it this way. Man is down here under God's justice, and the pathway back to God is seeing who Jesus Christ is and putting your faith in Christ. Faith in itself isn't the pathway back, but the cross of Christ is. He is the Savior. And when a man believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, he is put back into a love relationship with God. And notice on the circles there, the sin is removed from the spiritual side and the Holy Spirit actually comes and lives within. Jesus Christ himself begins to dwell inside the life. And that capacity to know God is restored. And, of course, I drew these as arrows because we're in this for eternity. The Bible says we're created in the image of God. And we're all going to be around. Everybody here in the Marriott, everybody in downtown Portland will still be around 500 years from today. We'll be in existence 500,000 years from today. We're created in the image of God. We're not like the beasts of the field that perish. We're going to be around for eternity either in an eternal love relationship, the Bible calls it heaven, or eternal justice, eternal death, the Bible calls it hell. Now, this is so crucial to every aspect of life, but it is so crucial to your marriage. Because as I said, you have two people and... uh, You have two people, and they grow. And our tastes change, our interests change. And, you know, we grow. And uh, I remember when I was was engaged, I was 21. And I was working in downtown Portland. And I was working on a crew of men that were all older than me. And just about all of them were married, some of them on their second. One guy was on his third marriage. And they weren't all that much older than me. But I was engaged, and I was excited about Chris, and they knew it. And... and, uh, I remember one day, uh, Jim came to see me in the office. He said, hey, Scott, let me talk to you. And he said, don't get married. And I said, what? He said, don't get married. And he didn't even know Chris, you know. Uh, He knew me, though. (laughs) And he said, you're too young to get married. He said, you know, you're going to change. Your life's going to change. And he was, Jim, he had one of the strongest marriages in the crew, I thought. And Jim was 29 at the time. And when you're 21, 29 looked old. <laughs> it looks pretty young to me now, you know what I mean? But in those days, I thought of him as he had his marriage under control. He'd been married about 10 years. He'd been married when he was about my age. And he said, you've got way too much changing to do yet. And, you know, here's what happens, and here's what he described. He didn't draw it out on paper, but he'd, he, he might as well have drawn this. You know, two people meet, and they date, and they see that they're like one another, and they have similarities, and there's common interests. And they say, hey, this is great. And they marry. And uh, they tie the knot. And he said, but you're too young, Scott. You're too young. You wait till you're you're about 30. And he said, and what he was saying basically, and he went on to describe that he and his wife, their lives continued to change. You know? And they'd married at about 20, 21. And uh, their lives continued to change. And they were drifting apart. And he had one of the best marriages on the crew. And he was the one saying, don't get married. You're going to change too much. You're too young. Don't get married. And I remember trying to describe to him and saying, you know, and he knew I was a Christian. I'd shared Christ with him. In fact, I'd shared that diagram I just drew you. I had uh, put one day at lunchtime with him, you know, and I was talking to him about Christ. And he knew that. And I said, you know, Jim, with me and Chris, it's different. And, uh, you know, but he'd been married 10 years and I was 21. Who was I to tell him, you know? And I said, we have Christ in our lives. And, uh, you know, I described to him, you see, because when two Christians come together, it's a whole different deal. And there is change in life. But Jesus Christ isn't just an interest. He's the Lord. He's the source of life. He is my life. And He is the source of Chris's life. He is her life. And yes, we change. And we become more like Christ. And if you want a picture of what the Christian life is, the Holy Spirit's whole desire, when you are born into God's family, 
through faith in Christ, you are born again. You're born spiritually. That, you're just a babe at that point. Then the growth process begins, and the Holy Spirit desires to make us more and more like Christ. And when two people are being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, intimacy is the result. When a man and a woman are really given over to Christ... They become more and more like Jesus, and I think that's a fairly good illustration of what takes place. And it is a lifelong process, and there's many bumps along the way, but it is so crucial to have that dynamic at the very core of your life to begin with. He gives us the power to love as we ought to love, to respect and submit as we ought to, to communicate with gentleness and truth rather than harshness and lies, and to accept responsibility rather than blame. He changes us from the inside out. If any man is in Christ, the Bible says he's a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now, it could very well be that you'd say, boy, that doesn't really look like, you know, when I look at that, that doesn't look like my situation. You might be saying this is more accurate, really. What Jim described is what's happened with us. That could happen because you're not a Christian, or it could happen, and it does happen, sadly, in Christian lives when Jesus Christ doesn't have his proper role, doesn't have his proper place in our lives. It can happen when one of us is stubbornly going our own way rather than submitting to the Lord himself. And that's why I say he is central to a healthy marriage. But the good news is that no matter if this is the picture, tonight, tonight... This can become the picture. If you're not a Christian, you can put your faith in Jesus Christ tonight, and you will be born again. When I was born again, I didn't hear any bells or whistles. There was no harp music. I didn't have hardly any emotional experience, and in fact, I worried about it. I wondered, did it take? You know? I thought, I don't feel what these Christians are talking about. I don't feel anything, but I put my faith in God's Word, and you know what? I still am. And that's the thing you do. You take God at His word. You believe in the Lord Jesus. And I've had plenty of emotions and plenty of good times with the Lord since then. But the day I put my faith in Christ, I became a new creature. And the capacity to be what I ought to be is there. The power to be obedient to God's word, to be the husband I'm supposed to be, it's resident within me. I don't always follow Him. I don't always let Him do what I should. But the power and the capacity is there. And you can come to Christ tonight, and I hope you already know Christ. But it could be that you've kind of put Christ on the shelf, or He's your Sunday morning stuff. Or you've, you've let other things take precedence in your life. And so that's what's happened with your marriage. This is a weekend when you as a Christian can put Jesus Christ back at the center of your life and your marriage. And then this can be the, uh, the result. And I'll tell you, it's not pie in the sky. You can look around and see a lot of crummy marriages today, but if you get around Christians who mean business for Jesus Christ, you'll see, not perfection, but you'll see the character of Christ starting to work out in their marriage. You'll see love and joy and peace, and you will see a growing intimacy, and it is a beautiful thing. It really is. And I'll tell you what, it's a great thing to experience. So we're going to close, and I want to just stop and pray right now, and I'd like everyone to bow. And even right now, if you've seen your need personally for Jesus Christ as your Savior, you could, in the quietness of this moment, believe in Him, turn from your sin, and accept His forgiveness. If you've realized what He did on the cross for you, You can invite Him into your life as your Savior and Lord. And He never turns a repentant sinner down. And if maybe you need to confess to Him as a Christian that you'd like Him to take control of your life, that you've been going your own way, and that maybe one of the first areas uh, that will show that up in our world today is marital strife or struggle. Uh... You do business with him right now. Father, every one of us uh, bow with humility. We're sinners. And 
we have that natural tendency to blame our spouse, blame circumstances, blame you, blame anything, rather than take responsibility for our own sin. And we can't do anything about it. The wages of sin is death. But we so thank you that you and your great love sent your sinless son to this world to be our Savior. And Lord, I praise you that when Jesus Christ comes into our life, you make us a new creature. We actually have relationship with you and we have forgiveness and cleansing. And we don't ever want to get over that. And I pray that even tonight uh, we would enjoy one another, that we'd enjoy our spouse, that we would enjoy marriage. But Lord, I pray that we would each of us uh, enjoy you and that we would uh, deepen our walk with you. Even this weekend, even through the things we'll learn in your word and the applications to our lives, that these things will make a real difference, not only in our personal lives, but of course then in our marriage relationship. And that our marriages would become more intimate, that our companionship would become more real, that our love and care for one another would be more Christ-like. And we know we can't do that on our own. It's got to be you. And we praise you that you came to do that in our lives. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.